Did you know, that total knees are older than total hips? In 1890, the German surgeon Themistoclus Gluck, implanted three total knee prostheses made from ivory. However, he was not very successful, and other surgeons severely criticized his work. Some other historic designs, most of them were rigid hinges like the Waldius from 1957. The Japar knee from 1972. In Europe, this design was frequently used in the 70s and early 80s. This is some kind of a modular Japar with a welded intermetallary nail. In the meanwhile we have learned a lot, and we can now choose between many designs for different purposes. Let me summarize the most common designs in short. Rotating hinges are constrained devices that allow for internal and external rotation. Newer designs additionally allow longitudinal distraction in order to reduce lever forces to the implant bone interface when the knee is flexed. Modern second-generation rotating hinges are a good choice for complex arthroplasties especially in cases with severe joint deformities and for revision procedures. CCK designs have an extended tibial polyethylene spine, and a correlating high femoral box. They provide inherent warus valgu stability as well as antero-posterior stability. Rotation is mainly restricted. The indication range is comparable to rotating hinge devices. Posterior stabilized prostheses are non-linked devices with a minimal degree of constraint. The spine is shorter than the spine of a CCK prosthesis. That's why these implants provide no warus valgu stability. As we know, PCL retaining devices are the mostly used standard implants for primary knee replacements with intact collateral and posterior cruciate ligaments. Unicondylar devices provide the fewest amount of implant for unicompartimental arthritis. Talking about design, we must be aware of an e-implant's basic functions. It has to provide a wide range of motion with a good stability. Load transfer to the bone must be adequate and we need a high wear resistance. Finally, materials have to be biocompatible, and this is our first topic. The bone's biological reaction to an implant is like fracture healing. The resection plane is traumatized and we find an initial resorption phase followed by a phase of repair. According to the specific type of repair, we can distinguish between three groups of biomaterials. Biotolerant materials, such as polyethylene or PMMA are characterized by a thin fibrous tissue layer at the bone implant interface. The corresponding biological healing reaction is called, distance osteogenesis. Bionerd materials, like cobalt chrome and titanium show direct bone contact, or osteointegration at the interface under favorable conditions. The material surface is chemically non-reactive to the surrounding tissue and this is called, contact osteogenesis. Bioactive materials like HA or bioglass are characterized by direct chemical bonding to the bone. This is mediated by calcium and phosphate complexes and we call this, bond osteogenesis. As we know, bioactive materials are a good choice for coating purposes but as they mostly have inferior mechanical properties, we can't use them alone. So, up to now, we also need materials from the other classes because of their specific advantages. We need bionert metals due to their mechanical strength, PMMA for cementing and polyethylene because of its tribological properties. But polyethylene is also our main candidate for problems. Polyethylene is an outstanding gliding partner for metallic and ceramic surfaces. On the other hand, we know that it's prone to wear and most of our design considerations have to take this into account. From total hip replacement, we have some data. When you look at the yearly height of abrasive wear and compare it to the average particle size, this will result in an astronomic amount of particles. Estimation shows that there are some hundred thousand particles set free per step. Similar findings are thought to be present in total knees as well. Besides abrasion, there are further mechanisms of wear, such as cold flow, cracking, 
delamination in foreign body wear. For minimizing wear, several concepts exist. We have learned that sterilization in air, initiates a long-term oxidative process which has a negative impact on the implant's mechanical properties. In combination, heat pressing alters the physical properties of the subsurface zone and makes it prone to fracture and delamination. That's why many attempts have been made to improve the manufacturing process. This includes raw resin selection, optimized extrusion and forming as well as irradiation under inert gas or using ETO instead. Cross-linked polyethylene is another concept. Using irradiation, high-pressure crystallization, and specific thermal processes, cross-links between the macromolecule polyethylene chains are generated. Cross-linking of polyethylene has been shown to improve performance in hip simulator wear tests. But there are also some drawbacks. Mechanical tests conducted on cross-linked material have shown a reduction in several mechanical properties including strain to break, fatigue strength, impact resistance and tensile strength. Looking at the main mechanisms of polyethylene failure in total knee arthroplasty, we will find exactly these types, breaking and delamination, but not abrasion. That's why from my point of view, at this time cross-linked polyethylene should not be used in total knee arthroplasty. Another important issue is material thickness. It is well accepted that the minimum height of modern polyethylene inserts and patella components should be more than 6 or better 8 mm to reduce the risk of cold flow and brittle failure of the polyethylene. Another factor is containment. When the inlay is completely surrounded and backed by the tibial tray, the bending and wear resistance is significantly improved. Finally, we have to optimize the articulating surface geometry. We have to decide between mobility and wear. And this is the key challenge in TKA design, the so-called kinematic conflict. The knee is not a ball joint. It has complex geometry and kinematics. That's why two contrary principles have to be taken into account, mobility and wear. When congruence is high, we have large contact areas with a low risk of wear. But motion is bad especially concerning rotation and translation. When congruence is low, this results in a high freedom of motion, but where resistance is impaired, due to a small contact area. Looking at the frontal plane, we have three types of articulation, round on flat, flat on flat, round on round. In a similar manner, we can distinguish between three types of contact, point, line and area contact. Most modern TKA designs have more or less congruent, round-on-round -round geometries, to achieve an area contact articulation. Surface geometry also determines the contact area's behavior in Waru's and Valgu's tilting. Spherical articulations with high congruence provide a homogeneous distribution of contact pressure, whereas tilting of a flat-on-flat -flat geometry, leads to edge loading with high contact pressure. But again, as highly congruent articulations are limited in rotation and translation we have to find a compromise. In the sagittal plane, the femoral radius plays an important role. Normally, the posterior radius is smaller, following normal anatomy. This leads to an improved mobility and flexion, allowing for rotation and rollback. Rollback is achieved by three anatomical patterns tensioning of the PCL and flexion, the posterior condyle's smaller radius, and the posterior slope of the tibial plateau. Rollback leads to an improved lever arm for the quadriceps forces and thus reduces load of the polyethylene insert. On the other hand, a smaller posterior radius decreases the tibiofemoral contact zone and flexion, and again we have a kinematic conflict. There are some concepts to solve this problem. When you look at an MRI section, that is not exactly positioned in the sagittal plane, but perpendicular to the transapocandular line, you will find a zone of constant radius, reaching from about 15 degrees of hyperextension to about 75 degrees of flexion. 
Of course, some people instantly developed femoral implants with such a constant curve. This concept may indeed enlarge the contact zone, as it allows higher degrees of congruence between the tibial and femoral component. But this only works, if the femoral component is implanted exactly parallel to the transepic endular line. Another issue is again, rollback and PCL tension. As we have seen before, the knee needs some additional laxity and flexion to enable rollback mediated by the PCL. Thus, if you don't flatten the polyethylene like in this example, you will get overstuffing of the flexion gap, and again we have to sacrifice some congruence. Another concept are mobile bearings. Again, we have the option to design more congruent tibiofemoral articulations. But also again, we have some new problems. We have an additional gliding interface, and these designs are known to require a high degree of ligament balancing to avoid dislocation or overstuffing of the inserts. For rotating platforms, Richard Scott has shown that too much PCL tension may lead to the spin-out phenomenon. Gliding menisci require perfect balancing for proper work. Otherwise, they might dislocate or show polyethylene overload as in this case. Note, there is no peripheral containment and the polyethylene menisci are relatively small. What about so-called high flex knees? There are some TKA designs that allow for flexion exceeding the standard of about 130 to 140 degrees. But the question is, do we really need this extreme amount of flexion? This only makes sense, if an improvement in life quality is achieved. Do we really need 155 degrees of flexion for stair climbing and bicycling? We should not forget, that if we increase flexion beyond 90 degrees, femoral push-out forces will arise the more we flex the knee. And, as mentioned before, a smaller radius of the posterior femoral condyles will severely reduce the contact zone and flexion. What about gender-specific TKA designs? Some manufacturers argue that women need an adapted total knee joint geometry. For this purpose, they developed femoral implants with a smaller ML diameter. Okay. It's a harmless design variant, but you have to store more implants. I think. These implants allow for better individual sizing, but this will not result in better outcomes especially in female patients. The details of modern patella design are not controversy. The implant should be rotation symmetric, it should have a well-contoured concave dome. The pegs should be small in order to reduce the fracture risk and the polyethylene should be at least 8 mm thick. Metal backing improves the mechanical properties of the implant and allows for porous coating, but there is a high risk of metal-to-metal -metal contact after polyethylene abrasion resulting in severe implant failures. That's why metal-backed patella implants are obsolete. And the gold standard is full poly patella implants. But the question is whether it is at all necessary to replace the patella. Many clinical studies have shown that total knee arthroplasty can be very successfully performed without patella replacement. In our own institution we have almost completely abandoned patella replacement with excellent clinical results. What about the future? We may expect that research will find further improvements in biomaterials. Metal, ceramics and synthetic materials are the main candidates for this, whereas the future of wood, rubber and stone is still uncertain.